Okay, welcome everybody. Um, starting off with a couple of announcements. First, just about the SQUID release. My understanding is that RGW is approved. Uh, I think there might be one or two pending approvals from other teams, but otherwise I think everything's ready and hope that we can ship in the next week-ish. So I'll keep you posted. The other issue is that um, there was some, I guess, change in Python versions or dependencies that's broken our ragweed tests in Toothology. So all jobs are failing on all branches at the moment. I linked the tracker issue in the agenda. If any Python experts uh, have suggestions there, please help out. And then moving on to the first agenda item, I just wanted to um, update everybody on the status of resharding stuff. So the contribution to change reshard so that we only block writes during the last stop merged last week, which is really exciting. Um, and I opened a couple follow-up PRs one is related to an issue with parallelism for the target shards. There was a new um, round trip added before flushing um, entries to target shards um, that was blocking essentially all other shards. And so I have a PR open that changes APIs so that we can fix that. Um, and the second PR that I licked here uh, relates to a performance regression that we measured um, just outside of reshards because we were doing extra reads of the OMAP header um, to check whether we were in the reshard stage where we need to, to log changes. Uh, and I noticed that this kind of duplicates a separate call guard bucket resharding that we do uh, in the same OSD ops but as, a, as a separate CLS call. And so it's not able to reuse that memory. So I have a PR open that changes the strategy so that we add those checks to all of the, the right calls so that we can eventually get rid of guard bucket resharding. Um, but we're going to need at least two releases um, to do that safely um, around uh, upgrades. Uh, so those two PRs are currently blocked on Toothology. But if anybody would like to review, they're linked in the agenda. Um, but now that we have the initial thing merged, the uh, kind of follow-up is to um, do parallel processing. This was a separate contribution earlier that we decided to stage after the initial one. So I would like to start working on design for this. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that I think C++20 coroutines would be a good fit for this. Um, but that would require a little extra work in um, adding some, while well, switching Richard to use NeoRados and adding some missing APIs or uh, CLS RGW client calls for the NeoRados client. That part wouldn't be a lot of work, but kind of restructuring the, um, the threading and the locking stuff would would be more work, but happy to follow up and discuss that later. The only other remaining issue that I wanted to highlight is just about um, trying to constrain the overall memory usage. We have a couple of config options that I linked here about batch size and max AIO. Um, that constrains the number of entries that we'll have in memory per target shard. 
but the number of target shards is effectively unlimited, or at least can go very high. And so um, I think the, the next project should find a way to um, find a way to, to limit that so that we can, I think, scale to, to larger num shards without crashing on OOM. I'm curious how much large reshards are, are using currently. It seems like it could already be a problem. But yeah, that, that summarizes all of my thoughts on the on the reshard status. Um, so so I, have, I have a question on, on the the next um like the issue of parallelism. So mm -hmm. once once we're not blocking the operations, I, I mean, sure, parallelism could make things go faster, but is there an actual need for that? Do we get into cases where resharding takes so long that um, it creates other problems? Uh, okay, so this this first PR kind of splits reshard into two different stages. The first stage doesn't have to block writes, and it just goes through all the shards, lists the stuff, and copies it over. But writes during that stage have to be recorded in a separate log in the index shards. So the second stage of reshard is essentially replaying all of the reshard logs and copying their entries over. So both of these stages currently are sequential, just source shard by source shard. And I think both of them could be sped up by parallelism. And I think especially the, the second stage where we are blocking rights to the index, it's important to speed up. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Uh, I don't see Eric in the call. Does anybody know about um, any progress in in testing this stuff? I know that we have a project downstream. I'm not sure if we have any results to share at this point. If not, that's all I have. Just looking forward to discuss discussing the parallelism stuff in the near future. All right, let's move on then to Cloud Restore. Take it away, Somya. Yeah, thanks, Ritesh. Uh, so uh, we have a cloud restore feature, at least uh, initial uh, basic functionality ready. Uh, Daniel has already reviewed it, and uh, we internally also have been reviewing myself, Jiffin, and Shreyansh. So uh, the, there are still some pending open items to address, but at least uh, the uh, core uh, functionalities, uh, we think it's uh, ready and can be merged. Uh, so please let us know if there is anything else we need to address. Uh, at least uh, the QA test uh, tutology, we haven't seen any regressions on it. Um, and also, we have some uh, things uh, related to Restore, uh, which we want to discuss uh, and uh, get an opinion. Uh, for example, the first thing is uh, how the restored objects need to be replicated. Uh, so as we briefly discussed on the Slack, like uh, Matt suggested that uh, we should not be updating M time for any uh, any 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 changes which is not ingested by user, which includes even cloud transition, not just restore. So if for those objects to be replicated, uh, I think uh, you have suggested Casey to increase the M time by a slight value, which was done earlier for Citators. Uh, but uh, we were thinking uh, if we can make use of uh, 
uh, I think Shilpa suggested that we can use may uh, we can add restore time and transition time to object time weight, and that should take care of uh, uh, replication. So that that's okay, right? Like uh, we we add one more attribute to the object time weight, which uh, sync process can check for. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, currently, in, um, we kind of compare uh, source and destination object uh, m time weights, and this weighted time um, has. Um, I mean, when when there is, you know, uh, the two the across zones of the m time is the same, then we use zone. Um, short zone ID and PG version to um, break the tie. Um, so I was hoping that we could use um, extra attributes like restore time um, in case M time is the same, then we could use that um, in right. object time weight to be able to, um, yeah, right. to be able to uh, do the sync without changing M time. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you think that could work, Casey? Um, let's see. So there's just a single timestamp that we're passing over HTTP in the if modified since header. And so you could teach the get request to use a different timestamp for those comparisons. It sounds like that's what you're proposing. Right. right. So this is an addition to what we already have. Uh, I mean, we have M time, which is what we actually like uh, look at when we are uh, using the if modified sense. Um, so I'm also suggesting uh, to add restore time um, uh, along with uh, zone ID and PG version to make the decision to use that to compare. So this happens when we do a get object um, as a part of fetch remote object. Um, and just adding the attributes to this structure should, uh, should take care of it, I think. OK. Uh I'm a little fuzzy on on the code there, but it yeah, is just one thing possible to just yeah. initialize the existing M time with a, a different attribute instead of just the the rate of M time. Yeah, basically that's what I was uh, I was suggesting. And just one thing is uh, that the initially the first time when you actually um, replicate um, an object, the restored, the temporary restored object to destination. So you won't have a uh, restore time on the destination. So um, so when the object is incoming from primary, when you're trying to sync and uh, you see a restore time, then you just sync it to uh, that st destination. Yeah, got it. Yeah. And then any other things that happens past it, the incremental things or the object should just compare the restore times. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, and also, Shilpa, as I said, uh, we have different times, one for transition, one for restore. So instead of using multiple time steps in uh, object time weight, uh, so I was thinking we'll have one generic uh, yeah. uh, time stamp, which we can use for any operation, not just cloud related, maybe yeah. even set at us. Yeah. yeah, I think that should work as long as it's just yeah. a single attribute um, and it can contain anything. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, and other question we have is uh, if uh, temporary restored objects should be replicated. Uh, so Matt is of opinion that they shouldn't be, uh, like, uh, because we temporarily restore it on a particular zone uh, on a location, uh, it shouldn't be replicated to other zones as it may not be intended. So so we wanted to check if there will be any implications if, uh, if uh, we have a restored copy on one zone and uh, just a cloud a head stub on the other zone. And someone deletes the head stub on the second zone, then we have we replicate that delete and will it end up deleting the temporary restored copy as well. Um. 
Um, yeah, um, I think such inconsistencies might arise. Um, so, so is there a problem replicating temporary restored uh, objects? I mean, uh, I'm not sure uh, why we shouldn't be restoring temporary uh, restored objects. Um, so, uh, so at, at least from what I understand from Matt, it, uh, they, it it just doesn't seem right because it's a temporary copy, and uh, so uh, if, if it's a suppose large object and someone restored it and it's only going to be there for a few uh, few days, uh, so it doesn't make sense to replicate it across all the zones. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure about that. So I guess yeah, Matt has mentioned over the chat it might be used uh, viewed as unnecessary for some applications to replicate temporary copies. I'm um, seeing some questions from Matt in chat. Do you see those, Somya? Yes. Uh, uh, so Matt, right uh, now, if you, yeah. Sorry, Sorry. Okay. from a side yeah. point of view, I think uh, I think you were suggesting that we don't even log the operations so that we can avoid syncing this. Yes, yeah. If if we decide not to sync uh, temporary copies, right. we can just uh, set log up as false. But uh, uh, but Matt, usually uh, if if it is permanent restored object or any restored object or transition object, if user is explicitly deleting them, we delete and even the stub or entire data across the zones right now. Uh, on the cloud side, yeah, uh, on the cloud endpoint, we don't uh, do any, we don't carry forward those deletes. The object will still be there, if that's your question. So, so uh, Casey, do you have any comments on it? Like, do you see any other uh, issues with not replicating temp copies? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm just thinking about our multi-site tests, which test correctness by listing buckets on both zones and making sure that each object is exactly the same. And that would trigger mm -hmm. a failure if there was cloud restore stuff mm. in Toothology. Are there plans to write Toothologies for this stuff? Yes, yes, yes. We we, we do want to. We, we already have two transition tests, so we would like to extend them to include Restore also. At least basic functionality testing will be there. If I recall, all of that stuff was in S3 tests. Yes. Is that where yeah. you're going to put the restore stuff? OK. Right. OK, uh, yeah. So maybe uh, we'll start with uh, not replicating temp copies, and uh, maybe we can take a call later if there are uh, more issues which we can't handle. Um, so the uh, so the, uh, next one, uh, uh, other one I had is uh, for temp copies, uh, uh, as Kyle had suggested, like when user, uh, we are, we are restoring the object by default to the standard storage class. 
but still uh, when user tries to get uh, try to uh, tries to do a get on uh, temporary restored copy we need to return cloud tier storage class so in the user response get response so we are handling that for guest uh, we are changing we have uh, made a condition in uh, rest code rest s3 response uh, where if it is a temporary copy we uh, we, uh, pull, we we update the xcmc uh, storage class header with the cloud tier storage class uh, but that doesn't work with list objects as list objects directly reads from the bucket their entries uh, so to address that uh, we are thinking we will directly while storing the directory entry in uh, bucket index uh, we'll uh, directly store the cloud tier storage class uh, at the back end uh, instead of just updating on the fly for the response uh, is that okay yeah that sounds necessary okay thanks uh, uh so the other one is uh, if there are non current objects which are transitioned and we are restoring them uh, them back uh, so they need to remain non current right they shouldn't be uh, they shouldn't be made current post restore that I don't know. Do we have any evidence from AWS? What happens? Mm, uh, no. What happens uh, in, the, in AWS? It, uh, it's not explicitly stated in the uh, spec, but yeah, maybe we have, may have to test it out and check. At least semantics wise, it it uh, seemed like uh, we shouldn't change anything. Only the data has to be present when we restore something. So uh, it felt like a non-current object should remain non-current. It shouldn't overwrite or become the latest and overwrite the latest copy. But uh, in, in case if that's the case, uh, Casey, can we uh, make that change? Like uh, when we write data, uh, can we uh, keep it non-current? Uh, I think by default, the code, uh, when we are trying to make the changes, it is being made as current. I, I haven't debugged uh, much into it, uh, but I'm expecting uh, maybe there was an OLH epoch mismatch, and that's why it's may, uh, getting promoted to current. Yeah, that's OLH epoch sounds related. I remember that for multi-site replication of versioned objects, we had to keep track of that so that we could write replicated objects that weren't the current version. Um, mm. So okay. yeah, I think I think providing the same OLH epoch that it, the version was written with um, should handle that correctly okay um, thanks Vicky. so so the last item we have is uh, so uh, uh, as for the current transition feature uh, uh, once the object is transitioned and uh, you if user does get on that object we return invalid object state error so uh, as part of this restore feature we have read through also uh, wherein uh, you know, when we uh, when an option is enabled, allow it through. Uh, when user does get on the transitioned object, we even restore the object and serve the data. But the first get and also in suppose the restore is taking time, uh, so the we we won't we won't be able to send the data to user. So we decided to continue to return the same error in valid object state till the object restore is completed. So we, uh, it may not it doesn't seem like a valid error to return that at that point, but uh, so, so I wanted to get opinion. Is there any other error which we can use? I, I guess I was expecting read through to actually try to proxy the data, but we're just treating it as a, a asynchronous re restore yes. request. Right. Yeah.
um, isn't invalid object state what we were already returning? Like for right. the stops, we yes, yes. we support head object requests, but get object requests return invalid object state. Right, and we are uh, continuing to do the same. I just wanted to confirm if, the, if that's okay. So, I, I mean, what I would expect for clients is that they would they would handle the invalid object state error from a get request by issuing a restore object request. Mm -hmm. Actually, even that, that's what even AWS specs is, uh, because they don't have this read through to get. Uh, so get will return invalid object state and uh, with a message saying they should use restore object CLI as you mentioned. Yeah, so But at least uh, th this read through is specific to RGW. So uh, if uh, maybe we could document, but is, it's OK to send this error in the object is I, I do think the error is the correct one to return. But yeah, just the, the read through behavior seems strange to me. Um, I mean, if, if we want read through, then I would expect that to try to proxy the data and actually satisfy the read request without returning an error. Oh, I don't, okay. I don't think that, um, I mean, clients are not going to like retry get requests if they see that error. Um, So I don't know, it just seems weird to return an error and also start the restore, even though the client didn't ask for it and it probably isn't expecting it to happen. Hmm. So from, from admin side, we have an option to control it. That if that option is disabled, we, ne we never restore uh, it uh, via get. Uh, we do return an error message that the story is in progress, but the error code remains the same. So Matt is suggesting we could let the client time out or return 503. So, I mean, is is there a particular reason why we don't try to proxy the data and satisfy the initial GET request, just streaming data as it comes in? In that case, the client would never see an error and it would just look normal. Yeah, oh, uh, to be frank, we haven't tried that, but yeah, we could do so, uh, but do you, do you say this uh, uh, sending, I mean, getting via async uh, request um, is not a, I mean, shouldn't be the case? So also, if it's a, in case of large objects, uh, um, it could lead to timeouts, right? You have to stream the data. It, the client wouldn't timeout as long as we're 
still sending response data. Okay. And also, uh, yeah, uh, Matt made a point. Uh, so this uh, feature Cloud Restore, um, so right now it's using get to fetch the object from the remote. But in future, we have to uh, extend it to use Restore APIs or Glacier APIs, for example, if it's a tape use case. So in that case, we may not be able to stream the data. Yeah, yeah I, I apologize for breaking in here. I do not want to see us just assume this proposal of forcing a proxy read through synchronously. I do not think that should be the only option. I'm not quite sure if there is need to be some semantic adjustment, but I but I think that's unwise. Um so I mean I'm just curious why why we want gets to trigger automatically instead of doing what Amazon does and returning an error and letting the client decide whether to restore or not. If it's explicit for the clients, then we know that they're requesting a restore and we'll wait on the results. But if we just do it on a get request, they see an error, but would be relying on RGW specific behavior. Well, so what? I mean, HSM systems going back into the 80s have had this kind of behavior. So I mean, you can use the explicit APIs if you want, but the APIs are about restoring data. Um, we, we, can, we, can, we, can use, we can use the request as indication that clients are interested and make a decision whether to prime it or not. Well, the principle, principle of the locality applies here. We don't have to do it, um, but it, but in many cases it will make sense to do it. If we've if we've chosen to read through, um, that's you know then then, then it's simply a, then it's simply a form of asynchrony. Don't like forcing the you know the, the remote proxy, and it's not even possible in some of the cases we're considering supporting, such as with uh, a big tape fabric, big tape a big, a big tape complex. It will it may, it may very well take many many minutes or even hours to get that data hot. Yeah, the virtual object APIs are going to be there. Well, I think transparent read through is a good idea, and it was proposed by you know <laughs> almost eight years ago now by people who when we sort of first started proposing this. Okay. I just saw that behavior in the PR, and it, the the term read through just didn't seem to match what what that was doing. But I think it's just confusion on my part then. Well, I think it's a mixture of things, but but the, but the, but the synchronous behavior that we that we that we that we have is. Uh, is, is is going to be convenient. I mean, I think. I mean, I think there are scenarios where we're, we're letting it read through would make sense, um, but I but I don't think we should try to force the implementation to do it. You know, in all, in all cases, because there are some some cases where it just won't do it. It won't. It won't, it won't be appealing. Yeah, and I I get that, but I it also seems like in those cases, triggering a restore every time would be more expensive and not always what the the client wants. That's possible, but there. But I think there's a middle ground of cases where 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 it'll be a win. The next time you look for it, it'll be there. Okay, 
and this is configurable. It's, is is it on by default? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if we've, if we've sorted that. What's the, what's the answer to that question? Uh, I think it's uh, no, it's uh, disabled by default. I need to check. Sorry, or we could do it even if it's not. And also, uh, uh, this yeah, it's software default. Sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. Okay. It's Thank software you. default. Uh, and also, with this read through, we are supporting only temporary copies. The user won't be able to make permanent copies. See a question in chat from Shilpa. Yes. Copied objects do become current in a version bucket. Should cloud restored object behave the same way? Uh, I, I, so, I guess not. Uh, because uh, when we restore, we, we are not even updating the M time. So it's just that data wasn't there. And now the data is present without any other changes. At least I feel well, so. We're talking about temporary restore. What is AWS semantics for for what what for for an ordinary for, for what you know? Well, the, temp the temporary concept. I mean, but I mean, for a, for, for a permanent restore, doesn't it overwrite what was? There? Uh, AWS doesn't support permanent restore. So it so it's, okay. Well, I'm, okay. So you'd have to copy. You, so you'd have to copy it to the to the original storage class. Right. 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 Okay. Right. So I think that explains it. Basically, it would be a copy, and it would over, and it would, and, it would, and, it, and that would be incorporated, and that's how, and that's how it would work if you copied it to the new, to the to the current to the to the active storage class. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So you would have to do a restore to make it local, and then a copy to hmm. make it permanent. Is that what I'm right. hearing? Yes, well, no, at least that's what AWS does. You, you wouldn't even well, you wouldn't do the two steps, right? You, you you could just say copy from the other storage class to this one. I think it will let you use a copy source that's archived. Uh, no, uh, so uh, in AWS, yeah, they you, they we can't copy directly from the archive. They we have to run the uh, restore. Right. You uh, actually would. Okay, I apologize. Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, we have to get uh, the download the object via restore, uh, mm -hmm. which is a temporary copy, and then to make it permanent. But it's in there, but, it, but, it, but even though we have a local copy to of it, it's 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 in the it's in it's in the archive storage class or whatever whatever that was, right. or whatever. Right. And then we can. Right. That's why a post restore also in AWS the storage class doesn't change, and uh, I'm assuming the same applies for even non current or other attributes. Okay, that's interesting. I, well, I do think it's well motivated for the temporary restores to um, to not be promoted to current. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, so also Casey probably uh, will uh, uh, will try to work on uh, proxying also at some point. I'll open a tracker so it should improve read through at least where from for the cloud endpoints where we can do it.
So, uh, so Matt, you're suggesting uh, we could issue timeout error, right? Meanwhile, instead of invalid object state error. That that's that's that seems semantically valid. There might be other choices, but that would but that would cause the client to come you know, to come to come back until mm -hmm. it was ready. If we thought we, if we thought that was it seems like if we if we think maybe the only okay I think my response like what Casey is saying is maybe we should only be doing this if we, if we think that the restore will be relatively timely. <laughs> we just we choose to do it or not do it, and and, and if we choose to do it, um, we can we can we can we can tell them we can tell them to slow down, and they'll come back and maybe get it. Not sure if that's a great plan, but it's, I think it's plausible. Or we could introduce, we, mm -hmm. we could certainly experiment with it. I think I think saying invalid object states okay. is problematic if what the, if what if what it actually would do is trigger a restore in line without you know without yeah. human, human interaction. That we don't want it doing that because um, it defeats the purpose of doing it at all. Okay. Yeah. So Somia, on the topic of OLH epoch, I found my PR that fixed sync of versioned objects. I'll share that, and you can see how the the OLH epoch shows up in those. Sure, that's great. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, so that's all I have for this. Uh, and uh, so, so please let us know. We we have a. Uh, 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 we have added some documentation, but as a more uh, as a design details in developer guide. But we'll soon work on the admin guide also on how to use use this feature. So, is there anything else we need to address to get at least this initial PR merged? Um, just the usual, uh, an approved review and a successful toothology run. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Any other thoughts on this topic? Okay, let's last on the agenda from Yuval. Um, yeah, so it's a fairly small issue, but there's a um, uh, I want to use a really old uh, PR that was never merged. Um, in in the requirements for bucket logging, we need to log something like the operation. What I'm doing now, I'm just using our uh, uh, like the RGW op uh, string or name uh, as the operation, but this doesn't uh, follow the standard. Uh, there is a very very old PR that someone tried to do that 2017 uh, to add those operations. This kind of touches all over. Um, so uh, like I was wondering if, um, if someone can have a look at the old PR and see if this is something that it makes sense to revive or um, I should not go down that path. I don't know if anyone knows the history of what was done there. It, it's mainly just naming our operations in a certain way that would comply with how AWS are naming the bucket operations. Uh, yeah, I don't know about a, using a big map like that, but maybe just the 
RGW op could have a virtual function saying what, um, like a canonical name for the op, where the S3 versions would return the AWS S3 strings, and Swift could return whatever it wants, admin APIs. I mean, maybe the default would just be the, the string that shows up now. OK, OK, that, that could be a good option, I guess. Less intrusive and more incremental to, to the code. There's also, I mean, it's, it's not just the operation. In some cases, when you go and fetch uh, like an, um, a website, then there has to be something that prefix the operation with the term website. And um, so there are a couple of things that kind of uh, make the things a little more complex. But I guess I can just uh, add that as a function to the op and then incrementally fill that with the standard terms. Okay, that, that's all for me. All right, any other topics? Thanks, everybody, for coming. See you next time.